around us are the sites of worship. For over 2,000 years, Christians have been gathering together to worship the risen Savior. That risen Savior said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it, shall not prevail against it. Where is that church that Jesus built? We live in a society in a day and age when everything is disposable. And there are those who begin looking for the ancient faith, the unchanging faith, the faith that you see in the churches of Cappadocia, in Hagia Sophia, in Constantinople, the same church you see here at St. Elijah in Oklahoma City, that you see in Moscow in the Russian Orthodox churches there, or in Greece. We ask you now, invite you now, to join us as we begin to discover the ancient church and set out to find the church that Jesus built. I'm Subdeacon Ezra. I will be your host and lecturer for our seminars together. It is such a joy that you're part of this with us. And in order to enhance your experience as we spend our time together, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get this course manual that accompanies the lectures, Finding the Church that Jesus Built. This over 500-page manual has outlines of each of our seminars, as well as appendix material that goes along and is coordinated with each of the seminars that will give you background information and further readings that you can do to learn more about the topic that we have just done. There's information at the bottom of the screen how you may obtain your own course manual, and I urge you to do so. It's been prepared especially for you, and I know it's going to enhance your seminar experience. It is a joy now to go to our seminar this evening. Tonight's session, we're tonight on our fourth topic, dealing with the Holy Church and the Holy Councils. Last time, we were dealing with the concept, the issue of what tradition is. We began to discover that there's a difference between how the West understands tradition as a loudly shouted, proclaimed dogmatic statement, and how the East understands what dogma is, tradition, as the living presence of the Holy Spirit providing an encounter with the living God, that we stand within uh, that reality. In a, in a sense, then, if, if, to make a bridge from then into tonight's topic and looking at the councils, uh, the, the real issue is what we find in Matthew 16, 13 and other Gospels where uh, Jesus said, who do people say the Son of Man is? And there's certainly a variety of those uh, opinions available anywhere in the world today. But the real question then comes in verse 15 of Matthew 16, who do you say? that I am. And this is the, the question of Christianity, and it is the question of the church and the question of the councils. This will be the issue that all seven of the ecumenical councils is dealing with. Who is Jesus? Is he, in fact, the second person of the Trinity, eternally begotten, uh, co-eternal with the Father, uh, begotten before time, or is he not? And so we're going to be looking at that this evening, but that is the background that all of these councils have in common. And the methodology that is used by the councils would have been the same methodology that was used by St. Basil the Great, and we referred to him last time, uh, particularly in uh, his uh, book on the Holy Spirit. 
that the liturgical life of the church, that is the worship life, the experience of the church is prior to the theology of the church. No one sat down and speculated that there ought to have been a resurrection and therefore created the concept of a resurrection. There are always those who deny Christ and then claim that it was invented, that the disciples stole the body, etc. The disciples did not steal the body. They were, in fact, cowering in hiding in the upper room, afraid they were about to be arrested and killed as well. And because of the experience of the resurrection, because they encountered the risen Jesus, their world was turned upside down and was shattered. So the experience always comes before the understanding of the experience. And the experience, the heart of the experience is going to be in the liturgical life of the church, in the worship of the church, in the presence of the church, where the Holy Spirit is. And so what we dealt with last week is not disconnected with what we're talking about now. We're just building on it separate from it being an individual experience, which it is. It also then becomes a corporate experience. That it was Peter taking his stand with the eleven, as we've already looked at, that all of them had seen the resurrected Lord. So they had had that encounter. All of them had stood at that peak at Diamond Head and had that experience of the thunderous waves that we discussed last time together. And so when you have that experience in common, that provides the basis of understanding and explaining to somebody else. And that is what the councils are going to be doing. So that Last time together, we did this upside-down T, the tradition upside-down, as the living presence of the Holy Spirit, this being the silent dogma, the experience of the Holy, the presence of God, this being the kerygma, that which is spoken, the understanding, the explanation, our scriptures, our homilies, the writings of the church fathers, and, and, and so forth, so that uh, we have had this encounter. This is not to imply that everything that has ever been said or written is totally inside the lines because this boundary is like the boundary of a river flowing or a fire. It, it, it's, it's, it's got a, a fuzzy edge. And so, of course, we, that's why you have been listening so far, and many times you said, well, I believe that. I've always believed that. And that's because that's in the center of the heart of what we believe. Occasionally, every one of us coming along will go, hmm, but I believe this, and then we discover, but that's not what is part of the experience of God. And then we have a choice to make, personally, of whether we move into that flow and a well-defined area, or whether we hang on to our particular item that we wish to hang on to. It's not my place to, to make that choice or that decision for anyone else. I, I'm just saying that as a way, as a heads up, that there can always be a bump, and every time we talk in one of our classes, there's a bump that happens between, I believe that, and, hmm, but I didn't, so that's what we're talking and going to look at this evening as we begin to look at the councils together. And if you return, uh, I, I have there on page 167 and 168, uh, we celebrate and honor the Holy Fathers of the Church, 
And here are the uh, services from the Vespers and from the, uh, the Orthros, the Matin service, uh, the hymns that we sing. Uh, and that again is the worship life of the church. And this is where our teaching comes from and our understanding as we honor them for having been inspired by the Holy Spirit and standing within this flow to be able to make an expression here for us. Uh, and I've included that. So we're actually going this evening to spend some time with the church fathers. Uh, and what I'm going to do this evening is step apart and away from the Western approach of being analytical. We are not going to discuss each council. We're not going to discuss what the controversy was, who was on which side, and the debate that followed. Uh, there's profit in that, and there's lots of books out there, particularly by Western theologians, that does all of that. What we're going to do instead is take a trip through the apple orchard, and we're going to look at seven different trees in the orchard, and as we look at these trees, I want to point out some of the features of that tree. I want to look at some of the apples. I want to point out, did you see this limb? Do you notice the bark here? I'm going to, remember in our first time together, we talked about living with the tree, or our second session together, living with the tree. So tonight we're going to walk through the garden and live with this tree as our way of understanding the function of the councils and the church fathers. So that brings us then to page 171, and I left the book on our bookshelf in our library, we're going to look at volume 14 of the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers series number two. There's maybe, I don't know how many volumes in the first set, 20 volumes and 20 or 60 and all, or a, they're all in there in the library. But this is volume 14. Now we have not included all of it here, but we've just got some samples from this. Uh, and I think you'll find this of interest. If you look with me on page 172, this was the introduction prepared by the editor of this 14th volume. I should tell you that the entire series of the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers was not done by Orthodox people. It was translated into English from uh, the Greek and the Latin by Protestant scholars for the main part. And it was done back in the 1800s. So this is not an orthodox translation, and we're not looking at something written from an orthodox perspective or bias. So, and here is what this editor, Percival, makes as his opening comments I think we will find useful. I think it necessary to make a few remarks upon the rule which I have laid down for myself with regard to my attitude on controverted questions bearing upon doctrine or ecclesiastical doctrine. It seems to me that in such a work as the present, any expression of the editor's views would be eminently out of place. I have therefore confined myself to a bare statement of what I conceive to be the facts of the case, and have left the reader to draw from them what conclusion he pleases. I hope that this volume may be equally acceptable to the Catholics and to the Protestants and to the Eastern and to the Western. And while I am naturally think that the facts presented are clearly in accordance with my own views, I hope that those who draw from the same premises different conclusions will find these premises stated to their satisfaction in the following pages. And should such be the case, this volume may well be a step toward the union of all, and the peace of all the holy churches of God, for which the unchanging East has so constantly prayed in her liturgy. I, I underlined unchanging East because here is someone that is not part of the Eastern Church that is making the observation that of all the uh, groups that are Christian, it is the Eastern Church that has been the unchanging from the beginning. In conclusion, I would add that nothing I have written must be interpreted as meaning that the editor personally has any doubt of the truth of the doctrine set forth by the ecumenical councils of the Christian church. 
And I wish to declare in the most distinct manner that I accept all the doctrinal decrees of the seven ecumenical synods as infallible and irreformable. Now that is an incredible confession to make. Signed, Henry Percival at Pentecost, 1899. So this man is not part of any current uh, debate. What was that, two, 103 years ago? He's not part of any of the issues that uh, may be part of our landscape today. Okay, then on page 173, the first ecumenical council. This is our first tree. And I have got, as you notice there, numbers, big bold numbers in the margins, and those are items we want to look at. Uh, and I will finally condense myself down to just those because we can't read all of this together. But the history of the Council of Nicaea, it's spelled nice in this, N-I-C-E, but it's, it's Nicaea, has been so often written by so many brilliant historians from the time of its setting down till today that any historical notice of the causes leading to its assembling or account of its proceedings seems quite unnecessary. The editor, however, ventures to call the attention of the reader to the fact that in this, as in every other of the seven ecumenical councils, the question the fathers considered was not what they supposed Holy Scripture might mean, nor what they, from a priori arguments, a priori means prior to everything, just let's just start discussing it, thought would be consistent with the mind of God, but something entirely different to wit what they had received. Remember, we started off with the parathesis, the baton that is being passed, and so the church fathers were not interested in debating what does the scripture mean, or would this work or that work. They had only one debate, is this the baton that was given to us? That is their debate. They understood their position to be that of witnesses not that of exegetes. They recognize but one duty resting upon them in this respect, to hand down to other faithful men that good thing the church had received according to the command of God. The first requirement was not learning, but honesty. The question they were called upon to answer was not what do I think probable or even certain from Holy Scripture, but rather what have I been taught? What has been entrusted to me to hand down to others? When the time came in the fourth council to example, examine the tome of Pope St. Leo, the question was not whether it could be proved to the satisfaction of the assembled fathers from Holy Scripture, but whether it was the traditional faith of the church. This tradition, the parathesis of the church. It was not the doctrine of Leo who wrote the tome in the fifth century, but the doctrine of Peter and the apostles then in the first century and of the church since then that they desired to believe and to teach. And so when they studied the tome, they cried out, this is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the apostles. Peter has thus spoken by Leo. The apostles thus taught, etc. And so that is, I think, a powerful introduction for us to the whole function of what the fathers and the councils are going to be doing. The first council is going to meet in 325 A.D., and I should say that if this is Turkey, modern-day Turkey, this being uh, Palestine, this is Turkey, this would have been uh, Constantinople, and the first council at Nicaea would have been in this location, which is where Nicaea is located. And so our first council is there. 
And at the first council, again, who do you say that I am is the debate that they will answer in all seven of the ecumenical councils. And so they began to put in writing not a new invention, but to put in writing that which they have always believed. They are now making the kerygma. They are now making the witness. They are now making in words that which they've always confessed in worship and in that silence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We believe in one God. I'm at item number four in your margin. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father, of the substance of, of, the, substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance uh, with the Father, by whom all things were made, both which be in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered and the third day rose again and descended into heaven. And he shall come again to judge both the quick, meaning living. Uh, the old English word quick means living. Both the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and whosoever shall say that there was a time when the Son of God was not, or that before he was begotten he was not, or that he was made of things that were not, or that he is of a different substance or essence from the Father, or that he is a creature or subject to change or conversion, all that to say the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes them, cuts them off. Uh, you can't say these things because you're outside then the boundaries. If you're saying this, there was a time when the sun wasn't, uh, etc. You say those things are outside of the boundaries that begins to be there. Let me point out another uh, piece of fruit on this tree, item number five. There is an excursus in this, uh, the writings of the councils that we're looking at in volume 14. There's an excursus on the deaconess of the early church. Uh, and at item number five, the second paragraph, there were women called uh, diaconesiae or presbytides, uh, which is going to be re distinguished from others, and so we're dealing with technical language. Uh, that is going to be there when you get to the first next paragraph. The one great characteristic of the deaconess was that she was vowed to perpetual chastity. Uh, she was never able to get married or have any type of sexual relationships uh, from the point on of her becoming this deaconess. Uh, she was a chaste virgin or else a widow. For the most part, most, most of these deaconesses that you had in the or very, very early church were widows. Uh, if you go to the next paragraph, the principal work of the deaconess was to assist the female candidates for holy baptism. So it was an issue of modesty's sake for helping the women to change clothing for the act of baptism. Uh, at that time, the sacrament of baptism was always administered by immersion, uh, still is in the church, and hence there was that such that an order of women could be useful in assisting other women uh, to be uh, baptized. If you look on page 176, down to the second full paragraph on that page, about halfway down, the deaconess says, existed but a short while, the Council of Laodicea, which would have been a regional council, as early as 343, forbade the appointment of any who were called the Presbytides, and the first council of Orange in A.D. 441 and his 26 canon forbids the appointment of deaconesses altogether. Uh, and the second council also in Orange uh, in its canons there decrees that deaconesses who were married were to be excommunicated unless they renounced the men they were living with and that on account of the weakness of the sex none for the future were to be ordained. Uh, so what begins to happen is it was a function that was there in the life of the church for a while and it fell into disuse because it became unmanageable, it was no longer necessary or needed. Uh, there wasn't much of an issue back in 1899 on this. There's a hot issue today with modern feminism and so forth. And I find it interesting that we come back to where the life of the church is and these issues were settled thousands of years ago for us uh, re regarding those issues and, and so forth. Uh, just mentioning canon number 20, the idea of there's no penitential kneeling on the Lord's Day, there is reverential kneeling but there's not going to be penitential kneeling. We don't confess 
uh, uh, our sins on, on that and come before the priest for penance and those kinds of things and we, we stand uh, and, and on and on. And then uh, on item number seven, the, the uniformity of keeping the date of Easter uh, begins to be raised. And at item number eight, an excursus on the subsequent history of the Easter question. And let me just simply summarize all of that because the church has, uh, the Eastern church has a different date for Easter than we have in the West. And so let me just quickly mention that to us. Essentially, the church decided, and when we have our last session together, and come back to looking at the historical birth of the church and the development. This will make, I think you'll uh, make sense and the pieces will fall in place. The church said you can never celebrate Pascha, our Easter, before the Jews celebrate Passover. And because of that statement and understanding, therefore we celebrate Pascha the first Sunday after Passover. That's the general rule that is going to be followed. Passover is based on a lunar calendar, and it's essentially going to be the first full moon following March 21st. is normally when that is going to occur. Except the lunar calendar doesn't always work out that way, and the lunar calendar may be at a, a, the second full moon past the 21st or something. So, the end result is that after 1054, when the Pope split from the rest of the church, and created then the brand new church, the officially separate Roman Catholic Church, that at that point, he changed the date for Easter for the Western Church. The Western Church, Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after March 21st. Always. Whether or not Passover has happened or not. For the Eastern Church, it's going to always be after Passover. It's a little more complicated occasionally, but that's kind of the rough outline of that. So therefore, about every three years, or every four years or so, East and West celebrate the same date for Easter. And I forget now, I think it was this last Easter, we all had the same date for Easter. Next year, I think the Western Church is going to have Easter in March, and we have Easter the first Sunday of May. And so there's two separate... So anyway, I want you to see that the issue of the date of Easter was discussed uh, back in the First Ecumenical Council in 325 A.D., and the Eastern Church is still following the prescriptions that were agreed upon uh, back then. Okay. Now let us come to our second tree that we want to look at, which is the Second Ecumenical Council, and it's going to have occurred in 381 A.D., uh, and it's going to take place in the city of Constantinople. So it will be the first council to take place in Constantinople. The attack, remember, who do, who do you say that I am? The attack against the divinity of Christ now takes a different attack, and it is to attack the divinity of the Holy Spirit. You saying, well, how does that affect? Because it is through the Holy Spirit operating and overshadowing the Virgin Mary that Christ is con conceived in the flesh and receives a human body. So the incarnation that God became man is dependent upon the third person of the Trinity. So if you can attack the third person of the uh, uh, Trinity, you have therefore attacked 
the incarnation. And so that's the, the background of this. Now let's look at item number nine. In the whole history of the church, there is no council which bristles with such astonishing facts as this first council at Constantinople, the second ecumenical council. It is one of the undisputed general, that is ecumenical councils, one of the four which St. Gregory said he revered as he did the four holy gospels. And he would be rash indeed who denied its right to the position it has so long occupied. And yet, notice the facts. It was not intended to be an ecumenical synod at all. It was a local gathering of only 150 bishops. I think there were 380 at Nicaea. There's only 150 bishops here. It was not summoned by the Pope, nor was he even invited to it. It was a local. He was not part of this one. No diocese of the West was present, either by representation or in the person of its bishops, neither the See of Rome nor any other see. It was, however, a council of saints. Uh, the Roman Catholic historian Cardinal Orsi says, besides Saints Gregory of Nyssa and St. Peter of Sebast, there was also at Constantinople, on account of the synod, many other bishops, remarkable either for the holiness of their life, or their zeal for the faith, or for their learning, and for the eminence of their sees as, and then he lists all of these men and names that are hard to pronounce, and I'm just going to pass over them. That way I don't embarrass myself, nor you, and uh, won't take time. If you come down to item number 11, on page 186, its title, its titlement, its entitlement to being the second of the ecumenical synods rests upon its creed that has found reception in the entire world. It was at the second council then that what is called the Nicene Creed was actually finished by adding another paragraph regarding the Holy Spirit so that the creed we recite that is known as the Nicene Creed, correctly speaking, is the Nicene Constant, uh, Constantinople, Constantinopolitan Creed, making it as an adjective, Constantinopolitan Creed. That's too hard to say for most of us. It's a tongue twister, so we just call it the Nicene Creed. And it's at item number 10. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before our worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one essence, one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick, the limb, and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. That was the confession of faith of that 150 and it has become the universal confession of the church ever since. Until 1054 AD, when the Bishop of Rome split from the other four brothers, started a separate church, and the creed was changed. In the West, the part that says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father in the West, added three words, and the Son. 
That in the Latin was actually one term, philoque, which means and the son. And so what you have here at item number 11 is a historical excursus on the introduction into the creed of the words and the son. It is a separating divisive factor between the Eastern Church and the Western Church for at least two reasons. One, no one unilaterally can change anything the church does or believes. And so for the papacy and the bishops of the West to act this way without the whole church deciding that this is in fact the baton that we've always had is, in, is incorrect. You cannot change anything and this is a change. Secondly, the Eastern Church opposes the Philoque on the grounds that it has never been part of the experience of the church. But what it does is introduce a broken trinity. That rather than the trinity being unbroken, we say in our worship service, we have found the true faith worshiping the undivided trinity. That's our confession we give while we worship Sunday after Sunday. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit in person. I can't explain any of this other than to say they are one entity, one unit, one power, in three persons, distinct, with all the fullness of the Godhead fully present in each. That is a divine mystery, and those of us in the Eastern Church are content to live with the mystery without rationally trying to cut down the tree and count the rings and analyze all this away. But in the Western Church, we created, the Western Church created, a procession from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. So that when you say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, you have this. When you say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, you have this. And what then happens is you begin to have an un, uh, a broken trinity and you have a broken kind of Christianity that begins to come into play. Let me just give you a quick example of that. In the United States today, you can go to any number of Protestant churches. There are a whole host of Protestant churches that when the word God is said, the people who worship there automatically think of the Father. That's God. And they think of God's Son as Jesus, separate from God, but His Son. And then some don't even really discuss the Holy Spirit. He's more the Holy It than a person and a person of the Trinity. If you go to visit a church, and I please, I'm not a hired gun, and I'm not trying to shoot, I'm just trying to illustrate what happens with the divided Trinity. There are churches that you will hear all the prayers are, the word Father is going to be used multiple times in the prayer life of the church. And their emphasis is upon the Father. You can go to other churches and their emphasis is upon Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus type churches and being familiar with Jesus and uh, call upon the name of Jesus and saying Jesus, 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 over really placing an emphasis 
on the second person of the Trinity. And then there's a whole other set of churches, uh, often labeled charismatic churches, that are going to place their primary focus and emphasis on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the miracles of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and praying directly to the Holy Spirit. And so once you do this, you create this broken trinity and a pecking order of which one do we choose to want to personally identify with and get close to, whereas in the Eastern Church, when you say the term God, we think trinity. We worship trinity. In our worship service, almost always we're going to say uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Over and over in our worship service, we always say the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, uh, when Trinity is there, uh, Trinity comes closer to being the name uh, in English for God than the word God does uh, for us. It's hard to think of that coming out of the Protestant world where God got transferred to mainly the Father. Uh, in, in, yes, ma'am. You're exactly right. In contemporary American life, the word God has become a term without any content. And, and so we're, we're defining it here uh, differently. Yes. Question? Yes, and here is a discussion, the historical presentation on that, so you can begin to see uh, where it has come from. Uh, and if you wanted to look over on, flip on over to page 190, uh, we can look at just a little historical side to this, uh, how, the, how it got introduced in the West. If you look at the first kind of full paragraph on page 190, there seems little doubt to the words and the Son were first inserted in Spain, perhaps as early as the year 400. Uh, they found uh, the Council of Toledo for some reason found, uh, wanted to affirm the double procession 
against a particular her heretical group. And in 589, by the authority of this third council of Toledo, the newly converted Goths uh, were required to sign the creed with this edition. And from this time on, it became for Spain the accepted form and was so recited at the Eighth Council of Toledo in 653 and again in 681 uh, coming out of Spain. Uh, but this was only true of Spain and it was, uh, was not introduced at Rome at this time. I should also add, Mohammedism is going to be born in the 600s and uh, Spain is soon going to come under attack from Islam and because Islam rejects Islam itself is a Christian heresy from the First Council and the Second Council in particular and is a rejection of the divinity of Christ and the confession of Islam uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. There is no God but Allah is there is one God but Allah. Uh, it's this singular monad God and the confession of Islam is very similar to the confession of Israel uh, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And so both of those stake out a position that is not Trinity. And so under attack from Islam, uh, there is some influence of Islam against Christianity in Spain to be pushed in this direction as well uh, to begin to try to define and come up with one God who is the Father that begins to slip in. It's the danger of uh, of this approach. But I want you to notice, uh, however, there can be no doubt that its introduction spread very rapidly through the West and that before long it was received practically everywhere except at Rome. In 809, this is important, a council was held at aix lac chapelle by Charlemagne, that's in what is today Belgium, I believe, and from it three divines were sent to confer with Pope Leo III on the subject. Charlemagne, as we discussed in our first session together, had to break the church away from, he needed to break the patriarchate of Rome away from the rest of the Roman Empire so he could create the Holy Roman Empire. Remember, it was created in 800 AD on Christmas Day. And when he does that, one of the next steps to further drive a wedge in the church to separate Rome religiously, to make Rome tied to the political unity of the Holy Roman Empire, the Western Patriarchate, and no longer be attached to the Eastern Empire and the Eastern churches, was to change the creed. And so Charlemagne makes this part of the political agenda for this to happen so that from the time of Charlemagne on, the new creed is going to be said in every parish church, everywhere inside Charlemagne's kingdom except at the Vatican. And the last sentence on page 190, it was not till 1014 that for the first time the interpolated creed, this new creed, was used at Mass with the sanction of the Pope. So the first time the Pope gave in was in 1014, and 40 years later, the split becomes official. Uh, so there are many historical backgrounds to this debate and the discussion, and if you're here coming from out of the Western world, you're going, what? This makes no sense, but it's a very, very important part of the unchanging East and a part of those apples that we're looking at. And there's more there and said and so forth. Let me go then quickly to page 194, just to give you a flavor, again, for the councils. Item number 12. This would be the first canon that they issued coming out of the second council. The faith of the 318 fathers assembled at Nicaea in Bithynia shall not be set aside, but shall remain firm, and every heresy shall be anathematized, particularly that of 
the, and all these hard names that are there. And so they're all listed. In other words, we are endorsing what has happened before. And then there begins to be uh, issues that are dealt with, item number 13, the Semi-Aryans and the Macedonians and uh, Pernoimatiki, uh, those that are opposed to the Holy Spirit. Item number 14, the next page, you've got the Apollinarians that, that uh, said that Christ is either a mixture of God and man, uh, that he's not full humanity and full God, but he's a, he's a mixture uh, kind of like uh, the Greek mythological figure of the Minotaur that's half man, half bull. Uh, they, they, they thought in those terms rather than two natures. Item number 15, the faith of the church revolted against such a mutilated and stunted humanity of Christ, which necessarily also involved merely his partial redemption. The incarnation is an assumption of the entire human nature, uh, except for sin. And the encircosis, the enfleshment, is an in anthroposis, an enmanment. It is the taking on of becoming fully, fully man. Uh, so to be the full and complete re redeemer, Christ is, both, is this completed uh, man that we're, we're looking at there. And then you've got all this other fruit you could talk about at 16 and 17 and 18 and 19. And then we come to item 21 on page 200. What happens when somebody is part of one of these groups that's out here? Not just in one item, but this is where, this is how they understand the Trinity. How they understand the incarnation or the lack of it. What happens if a person who's in this camp moves here? What do you do? Item number 21, canon 7. Those who from heresy, meaning those who are outside, anything outside of this is, that's heresy. That's, it's not, it's kind of just a, it's not an angry word. It's a word to describe those who are outside of here. Those who turn from heresy to orthodoxy, to that which is the true faith, the, the normal way, the orthodox way of believing things, like the orthodox golf swing. There's an orthodox way of playing bridge. There's a, this is the way you do it, the correct way to do it. For those who turn from heresy to orthodoxy, and to the portion of those who are being saved, we receive according to the following method and custom. Arians and Macedonians and Sabatians and Novatians who call themselves Cathari and Aristori and Quartodecimans or Hardname and Apollinarians, we receive upon their giving a written renunciation of their errors and anathematize every heresy which is not in accordance with the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of God. Thereupon they are first sealed or anointed with the holy oil upon the forehead, the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, and ears. And when we seal them, we say, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But everyone else who have been baptized uh, with one immersion, and it lists all of these people here, all these, when they desire to return to orthodoxy, we receive as heathen. On the first day, we make them Christians. On the second, catechumens. On the third, we exercise them by breathing thrice in their face, and we instruct them and oblige them to spend some time in the church to hear the scriptures, and then we baptize them. So there's one group that has been in a semi, has been in a Trinitarian position, and they come in by being anointed with oil, which is the second part of the baptismal service. Others come in by being baptized first, and then they will receive the anointing with oil second. And so if you were to make a decision to come into the church, you would talk with the priest. He would determine categories. And the normal category that many come in out of uh, standard traditional Christianity is to come in by chrismation. The oil will be placed on you. The, 
where they'll make the sign of the cross and the, and the priest will say, sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the congregation says, sealed. And sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, sealed. Sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, sealed. Sealed with the gift, sealed, sealed, feet, sealed. And, and I want you to know, you know you have been sealed. Uh, but it's not something that 10 years ago when uh, people like us all started coming to the church that they suddenly said, gosh, let's write a nice little ceremony to do this with. Uh, the church back in 387 at Constantinople, the Second Ecumenical Council, decided how. And they didn't invent the service then. You already had the baptismal service, and it had two parts, the baptism by water and the baptism by the Holy Spirit. And so those coming in today will either come in by if your water baptism is acceptable, then you come in by uh, the anointing with oil called chrismation. You'll be chrismated, or you come in by baptism and chrismation. And so that was decided way back then. Well, it's a good time to take a break, so. Well, as you can see, we've had a room full here of interested and excited people thrilled to be hearing the joyful news of the church that Jesus built. I'm glad that you are participating in this with us through the marvel of modern technology. And again, I want to remind you that this course manual, Finding the Church That Jesus Built, will enhance your learning experience as we do these seminars together. Again, I remind you at the bottom of uh, the screen will be information how you can obtain your own copy. And I urge you to do so. It's been prepared especially for you and designed to go with these series so that you will have in your hands the exact guide that we're using here this evening and will be able to read on your own time the documents that we're placing and making available in people's hands. Again, we're going to take a break here. We'll be back in just a few minutes. And I know you're going to enjoy the second part of tonight's seminar. Again, we welcome you and are glad you're part of this seminar with us. For our break, we'll try to walk a little faster through the garden, and I, I always promise that. I'm not sure I'll keep my word, but I will mention to you on uh, page 202, item number 23, that the Montanists were taken care of or discussed in the Second Ecumenical Council uh, from the, a man named Montanus who would have been the first charismatic, if you will, his emphasis on the function of the Holy Spirit, uh, and his two women uh, preachers with him, Priscilla and Maximilla and so forth, and they would have been condemned by the Second Council. This brings us into the Third Ecumenical Council. It's going to be the Council of Ephesus in 431. Ephesus is, would be on the western edge of uh, Turkey, and at uh, item number 24 says the innovation of Nestorius. Notice he is a bishop, and he's a bishop of Constantinople. Is known how he divided into two the person of Christ. So the, the church is the true church, but the congregation is not always living up to what the church is. So you'll hear that often, uh, that the church is the church, but the congregation may or may not be, and we're all having to be on our journey and upholding it. So even bishops can be wrong, which is why we do not uh, have private worship services. When we have a worship service, it takes the authorization of the bishop, it takes a priest being present, and it also takes the laity being present. If our priest were to come on Sunday morning and be here by himself with no non-ordained other person here, he cannot have a worship service. The function of the laity, in a sense when we are baptized, we become laity. It doesn't just mean loosely the people. It, it's those of us that are laity, that is, in our baptism, are ordained to the ministry of the laity. And because we are not a broken trinity here, we're not hierarchical, we are bishop, priest, and laity. And it takes all three of us to be present and to be participating. And in the history of the church, 
you can have a bishop fall into error. And that bishop can be opposed by other bishops, but it is the weight of the laity that has guarded the baton at least as much as it has been the theology of those that have been ordained. Now, I'm being very honest with you here. The layman, the laity, has a ministry, not only of worship. We are not spectators at worship. We are participants. Nor are we spectators in our faith. We are to know what it is we have experienced and what the church helps us understand about that experience. Part of what we're doing here together. If you were to come into the church, I would pray that you would not stop coming on Wednesday nights, but would continue to come to the other classes and continue to grow in the understanding of what you are experiencing in worship and what you are experiencing in your life on your journey with God. That is taking place not only for your own enrichment, your own building up and encouragement in your own personal life, but then we together participating here can recognize that which doesn't sound right. It's those who are musicians and have the tuning fork that can spot the bad note that I make. And so it is those with the trained ear that know that that's the false note. They say that if you want to take a bank teller and teach them how to recognize counterfeit money, you never show them counterfeit money. You only show them the real thing. And once you have become so familiar with the real thing, counterfeit always sticks out like a sore thumb. And so it is with what we're doing here. And so even a bishop, where you're not a hierarchical church, you're going to say, well, we're not. We've got bishops, and you've got archbishops, and metropolitans, and patriarchs. Yes, we do. But no bishops are above any other bishop. And without a layman being present, even the bishop's not having a service on Sunday morning uh, without us. And uh, when we get to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, if we get there this evening and we're dealing with icons, the, lay, the laity were a key ingredient in carrying the day for the restoration of the icons. Okay, and so we've, I mentioned this to us. You'll notice in our icon of the Last Judgment, which we will look at on either week seven or week, uh, week six, I forget, I think it's week seven, I'll take you in and show you this. I will point out to you that in the Lake of Fire, there is a bishop being cast in. It might have been Nestorius, I don't know, but uh, could well be. Uh, if you look on 204 item number 25, Uh, it says there at item 25, and it's, we are referring to Nestorius and others. In the Acts, he not only approves the letters and doctrine of Cyril, but disapproves also the perverse dogma of Nestorius. We're talking about Celestine, who is standing against Nestorius, and he disapproves Nestorius on the grounds because he was unwilling to call the Blessed Virgin the Mother of God. Nestorius would not use the term Theotokos that we use in the church, which means Mother of God. And I'm going to flip on over to, let's just skip over to uh, page 209 where we have an excursus on the word theotokos there on item number 29 on page 209. And I cannot read all of this to you, but we're going to skip through. Uh, 
And if you were to look then at item number 30, but as in the case of using the term homoousios, so too in the case of theotokos, the word expresses a great, necessary, and fundamental doctrine of the Catholic faith. Catholic, by the way, in 1899, meaning the universal church, not the undivided before all the divisions happened. It's a Catholic faith. Uh, it is not a matter of words, but of things, and the mind most unskilled in theology cannot fail to grasp the enormous difference there is between affirming, as does Nestorianism, that a God indwelt a man with a human personality of his own, distinct from the personality of the indwelling God, and that God assumed to himself human nature, that is, a human body and a human soul, but without the personality that is there and so forth. Uh, it, it begins to be the debate that is there. If you flip to item number 31, page 210, I'm just quickly pointing out to you, we use the term theotokos uh, for the mother of God and for those of us coming in a Protestant world. It's totally a foreign term and foreign concept, so I'm spending just a little bit of time here. And if you look at item 31, it says there, uh, and he said these words at Ephesus, I can never allow that a child of three months old was God. So here's the significance of the term theotokos. When we use the term theotokos, we are making a Christological statement, not a Mariological statement. We are saying little about Mary and everything about Christ. We are saying that the child in her womb is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. We are saying that the Son of God has eternally existed as the Son and has had two nativities, one before time and one now in time, when he takes on human flesh from his mother, the Theotokos. The baby in her womb was the second person of the Trinity, is God. When he was born in Bethlehem, it is God who she gave birth to. When he was three months old, three years old, six years old, 12 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, he was God. He didn't become God sometime later. He didn't become God when he was baptized by John in the River Jordan. He didn't become God when he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't become God at the crucifixion, nor did he become God at the resurrection or at the ascension. He has been God from eternity and was God in the womb. There are Protestant denominations who no longer honor Mary as the virgin. They don't care whether she was a virgin or not. There are others that get upset when you talk about the virgin Mary. They want to talk about the virgin birth, but they don't want to talk about the mother who gave birth to this baby. There are others that uh, negate everything there are those that will talk about the Virgin Mary but don't want to call her blessed. And yet the angel came to her and said, Blessed are you among women. The seminar, as much as we've enjoyed it here, from time to time I get a little excited, but I find the things of our faith and the good news of Jesus Christ to be something worth getting excited about. I'm also excited about our course manual. And again, I want to invite you, if you've not done so already, to write down the information at the bottom of the screen and order your copy of this manual today so that you'll have a chance to follow along with us with the, the uh, seminar outlines each week and have a chance on your own to look at the material that is also located in the book. Again, let me tell you what a joy and a pleasure it is that we have spent this time together, and I look forward to being with you again for our next seminar.